Good afternoon again. Uh, the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs is switching gears here for the second half of our afternoon uh, to take uh, a walk through draft language um, for H702, um, which is our act relating to legislative operations and government accountability, uh, trying to capture the recommendations of the summer, summer government accountability committee that was uh, set up by H125 last year. And a uh, number of folks have been doing work trying to put a draft together, and we have a few folks here to testify. And so I'm going to uh, first turn it over to Legislative Council to walk us through this new language, and then we'll hear from some of our guests on it. Thank you very much for having me, Chair McCarthy. For the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Council. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? We can now. We, Good. Andrea just needed to crank your volume up on our end, but we've got you now, Tim. <laughs> Good. Um, again, for the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Council. Before you, um, let's see, committee members should have um, draft number 2.1 of the Strike All Amendment to House Bill 702, an act relating to legislative operations and government accountability. The new language uh, has been highlighted for easy reference, very minor changes since the first version that you looked at, I believe, uh, was last Friday. It can be found on page two uh, under section two, uh, having to do with creating the Joint Government Oversight Accountability Committee, specifically under the to be added um, <clears throat> to VSA section 971 creation of a committee in subsection two, having to do with the composition of the board. And this will now read uh, the committee shall be composed of eight members, four members of the House of Representatives, not more than two shall be from the same party appointed by the Speaker of the House, and four members of the Senate, not more than two shall be from the same party appointed by the Committee on Committees. And this was um, modified uh, in reaction to the committee's discussion of um, how to best make sure uh, that not everybody is on the same political party um, that would be appointed to this board. And that is actually the only update here, but I'd be happy to walk through any of the language um, or answer any questions about uh, the words on the page here. Representative Morgan. Uh, just a nitpick. I think it's a typo, Tim, but maybe not. Um, line three, page one. I just have to. When I was rereading the, the top, an act relating to act relating, did you mean to say that? No, know? that is indeed a typo. It should just oh, okay. be an act relating okay. to legislative operation. I was going to say, I'm not an attorney, but I think that's wrong. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. It's a glitch in the matrix, and I'm now worried about Tim. <laughs> Thanks, Representative Morgan, for the eagle eye. Um, just happened to see it. Great. Any questions about the new drafts, similar to what we saw last week? All right. Um, well, great. Well, Tim, stick around with us uh, in case questions come up, but uh, I think we'll move on to hearing testimony from some of our guests. And uh, I want to welcome Auditor Hoffer for his perspective. Well, thank on you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, as the state's chief accountability officer, I was happy to support the work of the summer committee and pleased to see you acting on some of their recommendations. I assume you're anxious to get this through the house before crossover, so I'll keep my uh, remarks brief. Uh, first, I support the creation of a new committee uh, to focus exclusively on performance, especially since uh, it can meet after the session when time is not uh, so precious. Uh, having said that, I feel strongly about the Summer Committee's first recommendation, which was, quote, to educate members of the General Assembly uh, on the importance of government accountability. Uh, that obviously is a longer term project, and I'll get back to it uh, later. But I do think it's critical because while the Joint Committee will take the point on this, if you go forward with this format, I'm hopeful that all the other committees in the chamber, in both chambers and the members uh, will take seriously the need for and value of a systemic approach to performance measurement, which also likely would take some time, although everybody's been talking about it now for a couple of years. Uh, obviously, this will take time 
uh, and the bill outlines a modest beginning. Uh, one clear thing, one staff person at JFO dedicated to this is great, but they can only do so much. Uh, in my view, going forward, not something that you or, or JFO is prepared for now, but I'd, I'd love to see the entire staff trained in some level of performance uh, measurement, not quite GAGA standards like my office, but so that all of them are capable and have that extra tool available for their regular routine work so that everybody can contribute and not just the one individual. Uh, but that's a uh, subject for down the road, I, I presume. For now, uh, some thought should be given, although probably not in bill language, but uh, as a conversation amongst you and your colleagues and Catherine and JFO and others, what standard of, of review the JFO staffer and others may apply. Obviously, my professional staffers use GAGAS, generally accepted government auditing standards, which comes from GAO, the so-called yellow book. And there's no way one person could do that, literally one person. Uh, it's very tedious, it's rigorous, uh, and I don't think that's required because we do that. And I'm not sure that's what you're expecting or the committee would be expecting, but there should be some conversation uh, I, at some point about how that will play out. And my office, we have some really crackerjack people are happy to help JFO if they ask. Uh, as for the committee's first recommendation, uh, I think I can offer something as we move forward. As you know, periodically, uh, when we release GAGAS audits, we typically inform the committees of jurisdiction and in many cases, they invite us in to talk about the primary or major findings and recommendations, and that's as it should be. I'd be happy to add another layer to that process, and uh, upon request, uh, or by invitation, I should say, we can add a layer and inform the members of both the new committee and the committees of jurisdiction about how we did the work, which we typically don't talk about. And I don't mean to bore people, and it wouldn't have to be that way, but my audit managers are really very good, and it might help your colleagues uh, just as a routine thing every now and then. We only do five or six GAGAS audits a year, so it wouldn't be terribly burdensome, but I'm happy to offer that going forward. Uh, and finally, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it's been almost 30 years, but I did some contract work for then State Auditor Ed Flanagan back in the late 90s. And at that time, state auditors we're limited pretty much to financial and compliance auditing, all very important stuff. But the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, GASB, had this crazy idea in the mid-90s and said, you know, we really should do more than that. It's important to track the money and compliance with statutes and rules, but that's the beginning of a much more important conversation about whether the money is being well spent and is effectively achieving the goals that you guys hope for when you pass these uh, bills and create programs and so forth. And that was a new thing. A lot of state auditors didn't jump at the, at the opportunity, but Ed Flanagan understood its value uh, to his credit, and he asked me to dive in, and I did a little work, and it's been almost 30 years. And that was a really important seminal moment for Vermont. Uh, Ed's successors, all of whom you probably know or may have forgotten, but they all carried the ball forward from that point. And here we are, and I'm so pleased that now you guys, after some starts and stops over the last few years, are ready to institutionalize this for the legislature, which I think is overdue, and I'm very pleased that you're doing it. So thank you, and thank the Summer Committee for sure. And that's about it. Um, Otter Hoffer, any specific... Uh recommendations or things that that we missed in this draft and you don't have to answer that now but if you given that the clock is running out on us over here if you do have recommendations about things we might include uh before we're out i know you were able to weigh in and really appreciate your help with the summer government accountability committee but um if there's anything specific you'd like us to clarify or um see as improvements to the bill definitely let us know thank you happy to get, i'll get back to you Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. And, and by the way, uh, with respect to the folks who are going to follow me, I have a couple of time sensitive things to do, so I can't stick around. Uh, I know that the gentleman from New Mexico is going to be a great guest, and I gather the summer committee made good use of his uh, knowledge and expertise. So I look forward to seeing the video later on. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Great. Um, I had asked um, Will Clark to um, 
maybe help us contextualize some of this work that we're doing a little bit. Um, I know he is joining us uh, and is kind of double booked from NCSL. So Will, I don't know if, uh, are you available right now to talk with us? Hey, good afternoon. Yes, I am, uh, Chair McCarthy. Uh, uh, for the record, Will Clark. And yes, I'm on a state visit right now. So um, yeah, but it was uh, the time that worked out really great. So I'm happy to be here today. Um, let me see if I can present my screen. We actually typically, so we can see you, we've got your deck on our committee page and we all have devices we can use to follow it. So if you want to walk us through it, um, we'll, we'll just look at you on our big screen and you don't have to do a screen share. We've got your uh, slide deck. Excellent. Okay, great. Uh, well, again, for the record, Will Clark, I'm a program principal with the National Conference of State Legislatures. I work for the Center of Legislative Strengthening, which is a section of NCSL that's focused on helping legislative institutions. And so one of my topic areas is legislative oversight. And so that fits really well with the work that you all are doing on this bill and then with the Summer Government Accountability Committee. And today I'm just going to go over just a, you know, kind of a high level review of some of the most common tools that legislatures have at their disposal for conducting oversight. You'll see in these slides, the first slide, just again, uh, legislative oversight tools um, at a high level. Um, are focused on the relationship between the legislature and typically the executive branch, though also um, with some concern to the judicial branch. And at the end of the day, these tools are helping you as members determine whether or not the statutes that you've passed and the various policies uh, that you've implemented are following legislative intent, that they're effective in achieving the statutory goals, that they enable good stewardship of taxpayer dollars, and then to determine whether or not they're in need of any kind of modification. So again, a lot of a lot of these tools are providing you with metrics in order to help you ensure that the legislative intent is being enacted. Um, we've got five major tools that I'll be talking about today uh, very briefly, and, and there are uh, clearly more that you could use, but um, um, they're some of the most common and kind of some of the, the better differentiations between the different types of tools, though sometimes they bleed together. Uh, the first the first major tool is the one you'll probably be the most familiar with, the one you spend the most of your time on, and that is legislative committees. Uh, some of the most important oversight work happens in these. This is where you're able to uh, take testimony. You're able to hear from agencies about particular bills and also to, to vote the most directly on pieces of legislation that are either directly related to a specific policy focus committee or on a fiscal committee. Um, and then as you saw with the summer, summer government accountability committee, they can also be focused um, in special and interim committees to look at particular topics and to focus on particular areas. And so there are certain states like Colorado and others that uh, really take that opportunity to have an interim committee to look at a specific issue and in so doing are conducting some oversight. Studies and analysis, again, a very common approach. Um, I'd say the main thing that differentiates these uh, different types of tools are who uh, requests them and how. So um, if you have a, a research division, uh, many legislatures do, they conduct research over the summer of the interim or possibly during session. Um, that can be a request, simple request from a policy committee or from a, a speaker or Senate president, um, or it can be something that they undertake themselves. Um, but often, um, some of the more important researches uh, and, and analysis and studies come from legislation. So oftentimes, you know, members can either as part of passing some sort of uh, large bill that has a lot of funding, they may require uh, some sort of annual analysis or an analysis in a, in a couple of years to, to look back. And then so you can pace, uh, you can place the, the burden on the agency itself to document that for you. And then that can be part of a review in the future. Um, and also you can, uh, of course, come up with statutes to look at existing programs as well uh, to get some of that information and have some examples on the studies and analysis page. Administrative rules review is probably one area of oversight that varies the most among states. Uh, this You have kind of two ends of the spectrum. You've got one end where states have the power to review rules and regulations, but they, in order to act upon them, they either need permission uh, and must work with the executive agencies or the governor's office or must pass legislation in order to modify an existing rule or regulation. <clears throat> so Washington is, is an example of that. They actually do have a committee to look at rules, but if they want to make any type of modification uh, or to disallow the rule, they have to follow through the normal bill process. 
Um, on the other side of the spectrum, you have Illinois, which has the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. And in that particular committee, they do have the power to veto certain rules without consideration of the General Assembly. Uh, so again, that's that's one end of the spectrum. And in, in the middle, you have Idaho, uh, which uses uh, germane joint subcommittees. So various rules that come before the legislature are reviewed in subcommittee and then uh, through a joint resolution, the legislature can either modify or revoke some of those rules. And But at the end of the day, regardless of the type of path that the state legislature takes, they typically have language or provisions that say that uh, if you're going to modify a rule or disallow a rule, um, you need to establish a violation of legislative intent. So again, that's tying it back to a lot of these tools are to help the legislature establish the intent, uh, ensure that it is it's happening as legislatures wish it to, um, and if not, to, to modify it. We also have sunrise committees and sunset committees. Uh, sun, sunrise committees are typically addressing an issue um, where there may be a gap in oversight or regulation. So they're looking at harm, competency protection. So you're looking at an unregulated practice and then determining, does it harm the public? Uh, is that due to incompetent practice? And is the public currently unprotected? If the answer is yes, a sunrise uh, committee may establish a, an entity or a border commission to address that gap. And that is opposed to, pardon me, sunset committees, where they handle kind of the opposite end of the process, looking at existing boards and commissions and agencies uh, and, and on a regular time scale, typically. Um, 44 states have used this tool at some point in time. Uh, the first office was created in Colorado in the 1970s. And I think Texas is a, a very prominent example of how that's still currently being used. And, and essentially just on that time scale, uh, they'll have regular reviews of a board or commission agency or another entity uh, who will be terminated unless the legislature takes uh, action to reinstate it. So it's a tool that was used far more um, back when legislatures had um, perhaps less uh, strength in terms of oversight or fewer resources in order to handle some of these relationships. And so, but as, as time has moved forward and as their, the legislatures have gained more access to more tools, um, some of these some states have uh, decided not to use this tool anymore. Well, you might remember from talking with the Summer Government Accountability Committee that the creation of that summer committee came out of, I think we had a five-year sunset committee that really was looking at all of our boards and commissions across statutes. One of the committees they recommended that we disband was the Government Accountability Committee because it didn't have the powers and authority to do what we wanted it to do. And that's a, in large part that Sunset Committee's report led to the su summer committee that <laughs> led to this bill that's before us. So <laughs> we're uh, we're we're dealing with the fallout of a Sunset Committee right now <laughs> before us. <laughs> yeah, and and then again that gets that gets to the end of the uh, at the end of the day it gets back to the just the extreme variation across states in terms of um, how these tools are set up um, and statute and then how they are implemented. Because again, I think uh, maybe, maybe other states ran into uh, similar issues with, with Vermont where um, that tool wasn't working as as they intended or as they wished it to. And so I think that's how uh, yeah, some of those some of those tools um, diminished, um, which does lead into the the you know your current bill and and um, I, I think a, a more modern development, and that is the development of audit offices and performance evaluation. Um, and so these are becoming more prominent. Uh, you just heard from the independently elected auditor. Um, and, and so I think legislatures are more and more turning to these tools. Audits um, can take a lot of time, um, but they can be a very thorough and helpful tool uh, for legislatures and also just policy um, implementation in general. Uh, the most common audits, financial audits, I think we're all aware of those. You may know someone who's been audited or been part of an organization who has been audited. They're typically looking at expenditures and revenue. Um, there are also compliance audits um, that can kind of bleed into internal audits. And then you have performance audits, which, um, uh, as as the auditor formerly mentioned, um, typically follow GAGAs. They follow specific standards. They can be very time consuming. Um, there can be shorter audits, but oftentimes they're taking a deep dive into a particular policy area or a, a, an agency or some sort of practice and really getting down into the weeds um, and then pro and providing recommendations at the end. Um, so those tools can be uh, very effective for lawmakers, especially when 
the auditor reports those reports to a specific committee or to um, a, a committee of relevance. And so program and performance evaluation, they, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, sometimes sometimes they are this one and the same, and sometimes they're different. Per, uh, performance evaluation, I think, is uh, a, a main differentiation is that they're not following those standards necessarily. Um, so maybe think of it more as a, a research and evaluation. But overall, they're they're getting kind of at the same goal, which is to review a program, review an agency um, at the behest of either the legislature or some other um, purpose, and then come up with a report about what's going on and then developing recommendations that can be tracked. So most of these are attached to the Office of the State Auditor, or they're part of the legislature or both. Um, there, are, uh, there are 34 states that have um, some form of legisl legislatively appointed auditor or audit office, and that may be a joint appointment process with the governor. Um, and then uh, there are some independently elected auditors, of course, and then some states have both. Um, and I'll talk about one of the, I'll talk about an example of that here in a minute. Um, but most report to a joint bipartisan legislative committee. That's a fairly common practice. And again, that's to help make ensure that the results of that audit go on the record. And then there are individuals either in a specialized committee or in a policy committee that receives those results and then potentially is in a position to implement those recommendations. And so one example um, that I'd like to highlight is just the, the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee in Washington. Uh, so they are a legislatively appointed auditor office. There's also an independently elected auditor in Washington who um, provides their report results to legislators um, in the Joint Legislative Audit Review Committee. Um, but the JLR committee itself directs its own audit staff. Um, and they provide information to the public as well as to members. So this is just some screenshots of their website. Um, and you can see here they have a very extensive audit plan that goes out to at least 2030. Um, and then so a lot of their audits are directed by legislation to look at specific issue areas. And then they conduct annual reports as well that provide information for decision makers. And then on the second to last page, you'll find some resources, just some pages we have um, on additional legislative oversight tools. And that concludes my spoken remarks and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, I really appreciate you like framing up sort of what what the different policy levers are, reminding us the context of what we're doing here and seeing what some other states are doing. Do folks on the, the committee have any questions for Will? I think that was a really, this is, I, I'm going <laughs> to hang on to this deck forever. Thank you. That was really. Uh, I made a note to do the same thing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I love what Washington's doing. That hybrid model too is interesting. And I think, you know, if we adopt this bill, it's <clears throat> somewhat similar to what we're proposing here, where we have a state auditor, but we have the legislature and there's some overlap, but there are separate authorities. Will, thank you for taking some time away from whichever state you're visiting right now. <laughs> Absolutely, my pleasure, and uh, happy to help. And then, uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Take care, Dr. Davis. Would you like to join us at the table? Thanks for coming in person. It's nice to like not have <laughs> everybody be on Zoom today. <laughs> thank you. It's great to have you with us. Welcome back to GovOps. Thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, oh, for the record, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Um, I shared a testimony document with the committee shortly ago, so I don't expect that you all have had time to look at it, um, but I'll be drawing from that today in my remarks. This is actually joint testimony from me and from the Chief Performance Officer, Justin Kenny. So I will be doing some partial reading, um, particularly of the items pertaining to the Chief Performance Officer's uh, purview, having to do with accountability and government um, performance management, um, and then partial unreading, <laughs> style a little bit, for the portions that have to do with equity and inclusion. All right. So um, first, we just wanted to acknowledge the positive steps that the legislature is taking on this matter. Um, we are really, really glad to see this move toward institutionalizing accountability. It's often seen as the work of an individual or a particular office or entity or just some observant, loud member of the public 
to point out flaws, shortcomings, waste, or other uh, bad things that government is doing. And of course, we know that that's not an effective way to yeah. monitor government's progress. So we're, we're very pleased to see this. Um, we think that it's a really positive step toward upholding public trust and trust is key in governance. Um, and I think that creating a culture of accountability is extremely important because a lot of times we, we see that word or that concept as if it needs to be something scary, combative, punitive, and externally generated, as opposed to something that we're doing with and for ourselves. Um, so we're really pleased to, to see that. We also appreciate um, all of the efforts that you all have been doing around the rulemaking and, and just creating that consistency and accountability, especially with things like um, making sure that we have accessible reports and that they are actually being utilized and followed through with. Um, and we also think it's really important, this, this notion that you all have been grappling with about making sure that committee members and staff are regularly reviewing past legislation and past reports and just checking back in on stuff that we've done to make sure that it's working. So that's the stuff that we like. And, um, and in, in kind of talking with the chief performance officer, um, we, we had some, and I have the benefit of being two doors down from him um, next door. So we have these chats regularly. And um, so there were a couple of things that we wanted to highlight, some concerns and some things that we just wanna make sure that you all are considering as you move forward in consideration of this bill. So first uh, I wanna talk a little bit about knowledge and about the skill shift that's gonna be necessary. So I'll, I'll read here comments um, from the CPO. Some of the recommendations put forth by the Summer Government Accountability Committee, I'll call it the Summer GAC, uh, will require a significant shift in knowledge and skills toward program evaluation beyond mere auditing. Uh, while audits are valuable for assessing compliance and identifying irregularities, program evaluation delves deeper into understanding the effectiveness and the impact of programs and government initiatives. It requires expertise in reviewing theories of action, theories of change, uh, assessing program results and recommending improvements based on data and evidence-based practices. For this to be successful, it's essential that adequate resources and training be provided to equip legislators and staff with the necessary skills to undertake comprehensive program evaluations effectively. It's also essential that both of our offices be consulted and involved in the establishment of any program evaluation mechanisms. Now, this is partly because that just makes sense but also because there are certain existing statutory mandates that kind of require that our offices be involved. I'll give one example, um, the Act 9 of 2018, that's currently 3 VSA chapter 68, 5003, um, states the Director of Racial Equity is required to oversee the statewide collection of race data. Um, and then of course that statute was amended in 2022 to add the Division of Racial Justice Statistics, which is empowered to create a centralized mechanism for uh, collecting, analyzing, and reporting on those disaggregated data. It's one example of, of a few that um, help us be, that remind us um, that there is an important role for the Chief Performance Office and the Office of Racial Equity in creating that sort of enterprise-wide program evaluation mechanism. I will note we mentioned earlier um, data and evidence-based practices. Obviously, um, we feel strongly about those being good things in general. And also, I have to be um, really clear in saying that there are some times that the evidence may lead us in wrong directions or that it may create disparities. We have to remember that data collection systems and the sciences um, are only as uh, objective as the people who devise them. And so um, it is often the case that a lot of what we know through research or evidence is already tainted by bias. One clear example is most of the medical research that we have on the human body was conducted on neurodescended people. And so there's a lot that we don't know about the impact of certain uh, conditions and diseases on people not of European descent, which creates difficulties in treatment. Uh, an example I use a lot is the fact that we all can recognize certain clear signs of heart attack right, the left arm thing, the pain, but for women, that's actually not uh, one of the more common signs of heart attack, but many of us don't know that. We're conditioned to know how it affects the male body, um, but not so much the female body. So that's one example of how sometimes evidence-based practices can lead us astray. We know, of course, uh, seatbelts were famously designed using male crash test dummies, and so they are 
uh, less safe for women. And they, I think, fixed that. They got around to it. But um, yes. So knowledge and skill shift. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about how any efforts at program evaluation really have to be grounded in a shared understanding of what equity actually means. Right? When we're talking about the impact of the programs that we're implementing, we want them to work for all residents and visitors of Vermont. And that means we have to understand how our programs and how our work is going to impact different people differently. Um, for us to be effective, we have to be able to design our programs, design our initiatives in ways that are gonna use metrics that will surface any disparities that are going to uh, show up. So for example, um, we know that it's one thing to say, oh, research tells us that this particular initiative is going to be great for learning environments. I don't know, pick whatever it is. Um, what are the metrics that we're going to be using? Maybe classroom size, maybe um, number of hours of instruction, uh, test scores. If we're not using metrics that we can disaggregate by things like race, uh, ethnicity, gender, disability, then we could be missing key differences in the ways that our work is impacting people. Um, so whatever program evaluation that we're looking at and whatever mechanisms we're using to track our success as government really have to come with uh, adequate opportunity for us to disaggregate whatever data we're collecting. And then in terms of the shared understanding of equity and justice, it also means that when we're doing that evaluation, when we're looking at those disaggregated data, if we don't make sure that the people looking at the data know what they're looking at and understand a disparity when they see it, then effectively we could be just missing glaring things. That's why continuous and repeated, excuse me, consistent and repeated training are so important. Um, we know, for example, that a lot of staff here in the legislature tend to be seasonal. Uh, and so from one biennium to the next, you may have different people looking at the same issues, the same topics or the same programs who may have very, very different understandings of how those programs are gonna impact different constituencies. And so having that consistency and the repetition in, the, in, in evaluating things through an equity lens is gonna be really critical. Next, I wanna talk about technical challenges. Um, so I know that the committee has considered implementing a program kind of like Legistat out of New Mexico. Um, so we uh, are of the opinion that implementing a program like that would definitely require a big technical lift. Uh, consolidating vast amounts of data from disparate sources and ensuring data ac accuracy and integrity and developing user-friendly interfaces for data collection and analysis are just a few of those challenges that we're going to have to address. So for this to work, it's really going to be imperative that we have an investment in robust data infrastructure that's going to leverage modern technologies so that we can streamline our data collection and analysis and reporting processes. CPO and ORE have experience doing this, and we would love to be able to help um, continue that work. I do want to mention when we talk about data accuracy and integrity, again, that is another point where we can make sure that we're um, supporting equity and inclusion. We know that demographic data in Vermont are so fragile, partly because we're dealing with such small population numbers for some of our demographic groups, um, and partly because we have inconsistent ways of collecting those data. For example, let's look at policing. We know that in some cases, uh, demographic data are perceived. It's imputed, right? What does the officer think you are? In cases like mine, they're almost always going to get it wrong. In the courts, it may be self-reported. So now we're taking data maybe from law enforcement and from the courts, putting them together in the same databases, and we're going to have inconsistencies in those data, particularly when you have one person represented in encounters in each of those spaces now listed as different racial groups, right? So it's really a garbage in, garbage out situation. We want to make sure that to have that data accuracy and integrity that we're utilizing consistent data collection practices. The other thing I want to note is that we talked, I talked about user-friendly interfaces, and that's important for those who are going to be using data or evaluating it that may be members of this new committee, uh, other people in the legislature, or people in the executive branch. Um, but most importantly, those user-friendly interfaces really should also be aimed at who from the public are going to be utilizing our data sources. Um, that may be research partners, academia, or just regular old residents and visitors um, who are looking for state data. So as we think about how can we not just collect it and analyze it, but package it and report on it, um, it's important that in order to ensure equitable access to government, that we're providing an ample opportunity for members of the public to, to have the data and not just technically have it 
oh, you can download a comma separated values file if you want to, and it just looks like ones and zeros. But really present it to the public in a way that's digestible so that we don't just say we've technically complied with minimum requirements for access, but you can actually it and know what you're looking at. I'll pause there, I'm talking a lot. One of the things that um, you're bringing to mind for me is, is when we're thinking about data collection, the data we really need to make good decisions about lawmakers, the people who are collecting the data need to have their user interface be easy as well. We talked a lot last year about, for instance, the requirements that we're gonna have for law enforcement when they make a traffic stop to do data collection so that we can't have that disaggregated data about interactions between law enforcement and the public. And then we were hearing from different smaller law enforcement agencies that they just didn't have the technical capability to change the way that they do it and these kinds of things. And so, you know, we talked about a director of sheriff's operations and trying to provide them with the tools that they need to do that. Are those the kinds of things you would envision this new joint committee sort of holding all of our policy committees to new standards when we're looking at bills? when we're talking about where we get the data that we use to make decisions, or do you see it kind of, how do you see it living in the system? Because I'm imagining us trying to create a new culture of how we do data collection, how we use data and evidence-based practices. And in this bill, we're trying to arm this joint committee with things like subpoena power, you know, things that we haven't had before in order to be able to get at the information that we need. Like we're we feel as legislators starved for the information that we need to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering where you see that kind of residing and who's responsible for it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'll talk more about it in a moment, but I, I really see that as being threaded through everything that we're doing. So yes, I think that this new committee should be empowered to be able to uh, ask those kinds of questions and, and do that follow-up with the policy committees. But most importantly, I see that as frankly, of a laminated flow chart right here in the middle of every policy committee's table that says, are you making a new committee? Yes, go over here. Is it gonna be, you know, a timeline of block or, you know, how many people are gonna be on it? What's it, you know what I mean? I just, just, maybe that's reductive, maybe not. Maybe that's a good idea, I don't know. But I think what I'm getting at here is that um, it, it should be the responsibility to double check those kinds of questions of this committee, but the primary responsibility should really come at the earliest stages of consideration of a bill, which means during the drafting process and during the early deliberations process of the committee, it's really gotta be threaded throughout the process, not just as a final check. But I can speak a little bit more about that in a moment. That's really helpful, thank you. Uh, I'll continue um, on to readiness and leadership commitment. So readiness and leadership commitment are really essential for the success of the recommendations that were provided by the Summit Act. Um, we want to adopt a culture of accountability and that's going to require more than just procedural changes. It'll necessitate a fundamental shift in attitudes and behavior towards transparency, openness, inclusion, equity, and continuous improvement. Leaders have to lead by example and they have to demonstrate their commitment to accountability through their actions and their decisions. It's not enough that we just put out a press statement that says, yeah, we love accountability but don't ask us questions. Um, they should actively champion accountability initiatives and provide necessary resources and support and hold themselves and others accountable for upholding standards and delivering results. We also wanna recognize the important interplay between positional leadership and dispositional leadership. And we really wanna encourage efforts that are gonna empower non-managerial and non-supervisory staff to also participate in accountability activities and be reflected, see themselves reflected in those efforts. We also note that while the attitudes and the commitments of leadership are critical, um, there's still a disproportionate demographic representation among leadership and with that across all three branches. And that is a factor that's really contributing to that picture of readiness. Right, we want um, to make sure that our policies and our work is informed by communities who are gonna be most impacted. And part of doing that means putting people in the room who are from those same communities. And of course, our office leads with race. It is the most, sadly, the most stable uh, predictor of life outcomes when you account for all other disparities and demographic factors. Uh, but despite the fact that we lead with race, when I talk about demographic um, 
representation, I am talking about culture very broadly, not just race and ethnicity, but gender, sex, gender identity, disability, socioeconomic status, educational attainment, et cetera. So really thinking about who are the people in, the, in, in positions of leadership, uh, not just how ready they are, but also who are they and how ready they are. Um, I wanna talk about something that gets at what you were asking, uh, Mr. Chair, which is risk of responsibility application. Um, there's a risk that the creation of an accountability office or the hiring of dedicated staff or a program evaluation might end up leading to uh, an abdication of responsibility among individual legislators or other members of the other branches of government. Um, while establishing a dedicated oversight body can definitely help centralize our accountability efforts and ensure consistency in our evaluation practices, we really want to make sure that we're guarding against the perception that accountability or equitable governance are solely the responsibility of a special office or committee or person. Um, I can speak for myself. I know it's often the case that people invite me to things sometimes so that they can say, we've checked the box, we're certified not racist because Susanna says it's okay. And that's really not how it works. <laughs> and so similarly, um, we just wanna make sure that in the same way that one person isn't the brown who stamps something not racist or the woman who stamps something as not sexist or the one person living with a disability who says, yeah, this is fine. Um, we wanna make sure that you don't just have one person on or one office on whose shoulders accountability will solely sit. Um, because there's a large volume of proposals that come out of all of these committees. And I just can't imagine having to be the one person in our office having to evaluate all of them. Um, instead, we want you all as, as colleagues to that potential committee to sort of help them help you um, by doing some of this consideration on the front end. So um, we wanna make sure that they're recognizing their role in holding government and programs accountable and actively engaging in oversight activities and advocating for transparency uh, in your own respective domains. Learning from past efforts. Um, so I was privileged to participate in some of the Act 186 population level outcomes review that took place, was that, was that two years ago, three? Oh, man, uh, asking us about time right now. Uh, I think it was three, I think the Act 186 was three years ago. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, and uh, that year, the committee, this committee also had uh, let's see, reapportionment and pensions on for the same session. So the recommendations that came out of that Act 186 work did not actually move um, because we had a lot going on in the GovOps committees. Um, but the, the work was valuable. It's, it's still out there, right? And the population level outcomes still exist. And if we're reflecting on those past efforts, um, we really wanna make sure that we're raising important questions about why previous mechanisms like the annual outcomes report and the PPMB, that's the programmatic and performance measure budgeting report, um, aren't being fully utilized. I know Mr. Chair, you said earlier that legislators are, are, are starved for a lot of these data. Um, and, and what I find is that simultaneously, we have a lot of robust data existing in pockets that don't get looked at. Um, and so for us, it's, it's something that we're, um, that we're really committed to is how are we bridging that, that gap? Um, so there have been significant investments in developing accountability frameworks and reporting mechanisms. Um, but there's a lack of institutionalization. And I think that in some spaces, there's a lack of engagement, <laughs> which is undermining the effectiveness of that reporting framework. It's crucial to conduct a thorough review of past initiatives and identify lessons learned and address the barriers that hindered their implementation. By learning from past experiences and building upon existing frameworks, we can ensure that accountability efforts are more robust, sustainable, and impactful moving forward. That's the polite academic way of saying we need assurances and confidence that the reports we're being mandated to write are getting read. Um, I think uh, the Office of Racial Equity published a language access report in January of last year. Um, and in the year plus since then, we are repeatedly asked the same questions that are answered in that report by policymakers. And we regularly direct people to that report. And I don't expect everyone to have memorized it. It's a hundred pages cover to cover, our staff went hard. 
However, um, I think that, again, bridging the gap between who are the key players who need the information, where is the key information living, and how do we make sure that it's accessible and just findable is going to be really important. I just wanted to pause and say that we actually had a little taste in our H629 drive-by from Ways and Means the requirement that the five languages be available from the tax department for translation, which I think that level of requirement in that bill is a direct result of that. But I know that's because Representative Kornheiser and her crew are deeply tuned in, and that's not the same in every committee. And I'll take responsibility for in here. We have bills flying through all the time where I probably, if I was looking at it through the lens, would say, ah, we really should think about language access when we're doing X, Y, or Z. And there's so many lenses that I don't know that we really do have that institutionalization of some of the things. Like we've asked you to give us this information, but training ourselves to use it when we're not like looking at the words on the page about the thing is a cultural challenge that I don't know exactly how we get over it here, but I appreciate you like raising it as something that we need to try to do during this process. Of course. And you know, again, I maybe it's overly simplistic, but I mean, I love a good flow chart, honestly. You know, are we putting out public facing materials? Yes. Are they being translated? If so, into which languages? If not, why not? Right. Um, I also think this is a I'm so glad that you said that because it allows me to mention the impact assessment tool which I think is also another really great way to make sure that we are asking ourselves the right questions at any time. Um, I think you heard me talk about this before, uh, at, probably at the beginning of Biennium, um, but since 2020, the executive agencies have used an impact assessment tool that is required for any new budget or policy recommendation coming out of the executive agencies. And it requires us to ask ourselves a series of questions um, to ensure that we're not creating disparities or inefficiencies in whatever the proposals are. Those impact assessment tools are time intensive, but we believe, we strongly believe that they're very much worth it. Um, they will ask questions like, will this policy, um, if you're proposing a budget cut, is it going to proportionately harm any particular group in the state? Is this going to have a disparate regional impact? How is this going to incorporate um, cultural practices, including but not limited to spiritual or religious practices or anything um, related to particular demographic groups, et cetera? I'll give you an example of one piece of legislation that was passed um, in recent years that did not go through that process and that created a racial disparity. The Tobacco 21 legislation that uh, criminalized minors from possessing tobacco under 21 um, did not include a religious or spiritual carve out for indigenous people who see tobacco as a sacred plant. It's used in the conveyance of prayers um, and purification rituals. As a result, we ended up with a disparity that specifically impacted um, indigenous people in the state where minors could not practice those spiritual practices um, without coming under risk of, of criminal penalty. We know that that kind of a carve out is actually pretty common. For example, if you are a person who was raised Catholic like I was, you were drinking wine as a minor because the law said you could. Um, so it's not uncommon to have that kind of a carve out, but we didn't have an IA tool at the time that made sure that we were asking ourselves about spiritual or cultural practices. So that's one way in which we can make sure that we are asking those questions and they are top of mind um, each time so that we don't have gaps where some bills have it and some bills don't. It is my goal before I leave this earth or this state <laughs> that the legislature adopt the IA tool. Not done until you guys take it. Okay. Um, I want to talk next about uh, the that PPMB, the Programmatic Performance Measure Budgeting Report. This, I'm going to read directly from this because this came directly from CPO, uh, and I do not have enough expertise to be able to freestyle about it. So there is specific mention of the Programmatic Performance Measure Budgeting Report and the timing of that report. The timing of the report can be shifted, but a few things would need to be understood first. The report itself is released when it is because it's associated with the budget and includes financial information that comes from the governor's recommended budget. That recommended budget is not available until mid -day. So if we were to change the timing of the PPMB report, then it wouldn't include that information at the time of its release. Also, it might be helpful to know that only half of the measures are reported on a state fiscal year period. 
The rest are mostly calendar year, with some of them being federal fiscal year. So because of that, regardless of when the report is released, there's always going to be some data that's not as current as we might want it to be. Um, further, there's not an actual requirement for the Chief Performance Office to submit this report. Uh, the PPMB report actually came about as a response to 32 VSA Section 307, and that law required that as a part of the budget, there be a strategic plan for every state agency, department, office, or other entity or program that includes a statement of mission and goals that support the relevant population level outcomes, and a description of the program performance measures that are used to demonstrate outputs and results. So technically, all of that gets submitted in the budget already, and so what the CPO produces is actually above and beyond that. So it should be noted that the current version of the PPMB report is, is not far off from the way that the line item performance measures work, uh, excuse me, the line item performance measures reporting work in jurisdictions like Utah. Yeah, so we're not as far off as maybe we thought we were, but the way we utilize the data and the way and the timing of it being reported doesn't allow us to really process it in our legislative committees to the fullest extent. <laughs> yeah, and the way that I understand it is that regardless of when in the year we put the PPMB report, we're always gonna have that lag just because of the, the different reporting cycles that all of the data are using. So it doesn't seem like any time is really the ideal time, um, but that is uh, probably better for um, CPO Kenny to, to follow up on with you all than me because that is the limit of my understanding of this. Understood. All right, um, thanks for your patience. I am almost done. I just wanna talk a little bit about support for program improvement. So finally, um, if there is an office that's established to, to scrutinize program performance, we really, really urge that there be commensurate support to help improve those programs. Accountability efforts should not be seen as punitive measures. This was something that um, I worked really hard to demonstrate to my colleagues when this role was first created, that when I come poking around in your business, it's not a gotcha moment. I'm not looking for a flashy press release, right? We're trying to fix things. And so looking into things to make sure that we're on the up and up or that we're doing things inclusively or efficiently is not intended to be a punishment. Um, it's an opportunity for learning and for improvement. And so programs and program staff often face a lot of challenges that are preventing them from being able to um, achieve whatever desired outcomes they have. And sometimes it's limited resources or technical constraints or just competing priorities. So alongside the accountability mechanisms, it's really crucial that we provide support structures and resources to help programs actually overcome those challenges, not just point them out and say, you're horrible. Um, this might include providing technical assistance or knowledge sharing or disseminating best practices, fostering co collaboration with stakeholders um, so that we can really get at those systemic issues and, and what are the barriers that are stopping us from meeting our goals. Uh, again, both uh, the CPO and um, ORE would really love the opportunity to continue talking more about that um, because it is certainly our goal, probably our primary goal to support programs and staff across state government. Um, and so to the extent that we can be helpful in figuring out how to best do that, we would love to. Um, I will say that when we talk about ways that we can um, you know, foster collaboration among stakeholders or what have you, what I don't recommend is just making a new council for every new task that we create in state government. I think that adds to government bloat and um, sometimes makes things more complicated than they need to be. But in terms of providing support for programs and for initiatives, um, I think that's gonna be a really critical step. It's not just about identifying our flaws and shortcomings, but really saying, okay, what can we actually do about it? Um, the last thing that I wanna say uh, is, at least for our office, the most important, which is the summer GAC was charged with four main things um, over this past year and uh, were given four meetings to do it all in. Um, and several of those things related directly to equity and inclusion. So naturally our ears perked up. Uh, we were extremely disappointed that there wasn't enough time or runway to be able to address them adequately, but we had a lot of thoughts, so many thoughts. Um, and one thing that I am really urging this committee to do is, as you consider H702, 
I'm not seeing really anything on equity. Um, and it really needs to be in there because accountability is really about more than just the numbers, right? It's about the people who those numbers uh, represent. And so um, particularly one of, uh, one of the things that Summer Gap was asked to look at was um, equitable inclusion and participation on the state's boards and commissions and uh, per diem rates for people who serve on the state's boards and commissions, et cetera. We provided a presentation that is um, not just in the, in the written documents that Summer GAC has on the legislative website, but it's also uh, online in a recording. Um, we also provided an initial letter of testimony and a guidance document about equitable and inclusive committee participation. Uh, I would love, love to continue this conversation with you all. I don't want this to be a sort of passing thing in the night. I know that Auditor Hoffer mentioned that you want to get this through before crossover. And also the mention that I made earlier of competing priorities. We really need equity not to be competing with anything else. Because we're often told, oh, we know this bill is unjust, but we'll fix it in January. We'll fix it next year. And so what that, what that means when we say that is there's something more important than equity that is motivating us to act. And I, I have a hard time with that. So um, we have a lot of recommendations for how we can incorporate more um, equity, more justice and more inclusion into our performance management and our program evaluation. And uh, I would be extremely happy to, to either sit down with the committee again, or just to provide whatever materials would be helpful um, so that we can see how we can incorporate that. I will also say there is a very, yeah, there's a quiet riot uh, bubbling up among the many working groups in the state over the per diem rate. So I really think this is gonna be an issue that this legislature is eventually gonna have to tackle. Um, because it's become really clear that the demand on people's time, their labor, their expertise is not commensurate with the, um, with the compensation. And it's, it's really leading to us having struggles appointing people to boards and commissions and retaining them. This morning, I received word that two of my appointees on one particular advisory board have now resigned. So now I have to find two new community members who are familiar with certain topics in certain areas of expertise who are not already sitting on six other boards and commissions to appoint to this body. Um, and they're certainly not the only ones. So I do strongly recommend um, that this committee pick up that thread from where Summer Gap left off. And again, we can offer lots of um, guidance and, and suggestions. So that concludes my testimony, but I'm happy to take questions or other thoughts. So I wanted to start by saying, I, when I first got back the, the draft from the summer gag, and it said, we're focusing on one, two, three, and four are for your GovOps committees, good luck. And I looked at what we had before us in the first few weeks of the session, um, we made some decisions about what we were gonna do and how we were gonna plan that out. Um, I think if there are ways that we can make sure that we make this bill as good as it can be in the next couple of weeks, I see this bill as the beginning of a new process and some resources. I wanna make sure that we don't miss prioritizing equity, but I also think that we need to spend some time after crossover with you and other stakeholders looking at all the boards and commissions that we have, you put together some incredible materials in here that show just how many things you have to sit on or appoint people to that are just in the kind of like equity space. And because you're the office of racial equity, every time we put together an advisory council, we appoint somebody <laughs> through your office in order to be on it. Um, I, I think we need, we need to create space when we're not under the gun um, to actually go through that and do that work. And I'm committed to doing that um, when we get past crossover uh, and bringing some of that to light here. And then we'll have opportunities because we have several vehicles that are about boards and commissions and um, sort of the way the government works in order to add that in um, and take action on some of those things this year. But I didn't want it to hold up things like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission bill or just getting this joint committee off the ground. So 
those things have not been forgotten. The other thing I wanted to say to you is that I'm really committed to um, taking some testimony on the report you sent us on January 15th about your five-year look back. There's some things in there around the government accountability that um, definitely made my eyes pop. So uh, I thought no one had noticed. Uh, we noticed. Um, didn't know what to do about it uh, in a few weeks. So, <laughs> um, but we need, um, I think, to elevate some of the things that you brought to light uh, there, especially ahead of um, future flooding events. We're going to have opportunities when we get. Um, the flood bill that has to do with emergency powers and some other things from the Senate, I think, to actually address some of the things that you brought up in that report. So I didn't know this, uh, and other people in this room noticed. So I just wanted you to hear that. Thank you. Um, so questions for the director, Representative Fickley. Thank you, and thank you for coming today. I I have, uh, maybe it's more of a comment, but again, in, in the beginning of your presentation, you talk about uh, a positive step. Uh, these measures signal a commitment to upholding the public trust and ensuring that governmental actions are in, in line with the best interests of constituents. Um, I've already spoken in this committee about that particular thing, about in the best for my constituents. And I guess the issue that I had, and I've talked about it before, is What's in the best interest of my constituents may not be the same as Representative Hooper's. So that's where I have a real issue. And I also have, and there's been some changing here, which I appreciate, but the makeup of this as well with the four members uh, presented by the Speaker of the House, four members by committee. committee. I think it's, it's really important that we do get a diverse and, I don't know if you can say it, but a nonpartisan group to consider this because again uh and i've given a few examples over the years like even our child care issue i mean i think the state of vermont did the child care industry in with its regulations around education water quality you name it and and then we have another full-blown expensive child care thing it might work might not there's there's some issues there another example might even be the pcb testing you know that started out as we have to do it. If you disagree with that and you don't care about kids, now all of a sudden it's looking at like we may not continue the program. So again, there's just two examples in my mind of how is the government accountable? How would they look at that? And what would they? What would they? What would we do different? Um, so uh, again, I I understand the the efforts here, but I but I think it really <laughs> it it depends on on outcomes and. And those outcomes are subjective. Just get, I get what I'm saying. Yeah. Thank you, Representative. You know, I, I think um, I think that you're right. Different constituent groups and different regions around the state have different priorities for themselves. And sometimes um, that can lead us to feel like folks over here need one thing and folks over here need another thing. And so we can't come to agreement or 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 what have you. I completely agree with you that we want whatever committee comes out of this to be as reflective of, of everybody as possible. Uh, I agree with you that it should be nonpartisan, that it should be really diverse. And I mean that not just in terms of the demographic identities of its representatives, but also their interest areas, expertise, region, et cetera. A, a really important thing that I want to make sure that we know is that we're planning for and making decisions for not just the Vermont we have today, but the Vermont we expect to have in the future. And so I think sometimes we've got uh, a lot of policy that's built on what our communities have historically wanted or preferred or done. And what that does is it's pattern matching, right? We're, we're getting the same results because we're catering to the same uh, perspectives and desires. And as we're seeing a demographic shift that we hope is sustained and grown in our state, it's gonna require us to do things sometimes a little bit differently than what people are accustomed to. And you know, I, I'm reminded of a phrase that says, uh, at first growing might feel like breaking. And I think to a lot of people sometimes it feels like breaking. Um, but in the long run, what I have found is that it's really a collective benefit to equity, um, you know, curb cut effect, whatever we want to call it. Um, but I think that there is a way that we can communicate to the public that 
what we're putting into place now is going to help everybody and it's going to benefit everybody. And I think that that's, that's going to be key. But again, I do just want to affirm what you're saying about the importance of making sure that any new body we create is, is really going to be taking into account all those perspectives. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the director? Representative Chase. Um, to the point about us uh, asking you to point somebody to so many of these things, do you have any information or feedback on um, the, the people that have been appointed if they feel valued and heard and uh, it, uh, as if the committees uh, that they're appointed to are, are appreciating and, and um, incorporating their uh, expertise? Thank you for asking that. We rarely get asked that. And it's um, it's very validating to be asked that. A lot of the, so, so first I just have to say, um, it is hard for me to make appointments to things because I'm not pulling from the same list of 12 melanated people everybody knows, which makes it harder to identify people who are willing to be civically engaged and, and participate on these boards and commissions from Vermont. Um, because it's not the regular few who always get appointed to everything. That being said, um, some of the folks we've appointed have not felt valued, have not felt heard, and have not felt like it's worth their time. Case in point, the two I was just informed have stepped down this morning. Um, actually, that's not true. I think they were, they, well, it's complicated. Um, I think some have not really felt valued, and, and, and that's, what I have found is that that has less to do with the, the working group itself and more with the work product that they generated. Um, sometimes it feels like we make recommendations, we write reports, we uh, do a lot of um, inquest and research and tabulation and we say, this is what we think should happen. And then when it becomes policy, it's distorted by the time it gets to the other end. Uh, and that can be really discouraging for people particularly for community members who were told you're gonna to be heard and you're gonna impact change. Um, so I think that it's, the answer is probably yes and no. I know a lot of people who feel very rewarded and fulfilled um, being appointed to these kinds of bodies, <clears throat> like they are visible and have a voice. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's it, the more important piece is what we do with it at the end. And, and that is really what demonstrates to those community members, whether their efforts are in vain or whether it's just performative or they're just being tokenized by being brought into the room. And that's one of the things that um, we wanna make sure that when we appoint people that they know there are ups, there are downs. And, you know, we just, we want it to work, but, but for us, we really see the, the critical piece being once you generate a work product, We've got to follow through on it on our end. Thank you. We are going to have you back. Just want you to know that uh, I'm sorry, this is the first time you're sitting in here this year. I think it's a reflection of we have a lot on our plate, but we're prioritizing this as the start of some work uh, to do some institutional transformation and really uh, value this really thorough input. And I appreciate you putting the links to the materials that you sent to the summer GAC into your testimony today. I highly encourage everybody to look at that. <laughs> it is quite illuminating what uh, Director Davis said to the GAC uh, this summer. Thank you for Thank all, you all of your hard work. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right. Um, Anna, are you, aren't great. <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Of course, thank you for having me. For the record, my name is Anna Brulette and I'm the Policy and Program Director for Building Bright Futures, which is Vermont's Early Childhood State Advisory Council. Uh, I want to first briefly introduce Building Bright Futures' role in Vermont's early childhood system, uh, and then I will speak to some key considerations for you all on H702, many of which I think you'll find are pretty aligned with observations that others have made thus far today. BBF is an early childhood public-private partnership charged under Title 33, Chapter 46, and the Federal Head Start Act to serve as Vermont's Early Childhood State Advisory Council. 
It serves as the mechanism used to advise the governor and the legislature on the well-being of young children and their families from the prenatal period to age eight. Uh, and before I dive in, just want to call out that we do not directly support or oppose any specific proposal or bill. And instead, our role is really to convene and elevate the voices of families and communities, early childhood partners, monitor the system by identifying and providing high quality up to date data to inform policy and decision making. So with that, I'm going to dive into describing a little bit of our role in monitoring and accountability within Vermont's early childhood system through Title III. Title 33, Chapter 46, and more recently, we are charged under Act 76 with monitoring the new investments and policy changes being made to Vermont's child care and early education system. In addition to this work, BVF is also conducting the monitoring and evaluation for the preschool development grant, which is bringing over $7 million a year to the state with activities spanning five agencies and organizations. I will share more in a moment, but first I just want to outline our key considerations or highlights from the testimony that I also have submitted for the record for you all to review uh, based on our role and experience with monitoring and accountability, along with some recent policy recommendations endorsed by Vermont's Early Childhood State Advisory Council. First, we want to note that defining success and selecting measures to track and understand the impact of policy change as others have pointed out today, is a really complex process and requires partner engagement and expertise. It is also key to ensure that those with lived experience relevant to a proposal are consulted in defining that success and that their role is explicitly named in the system or infrastructure that we are creating to monitor uh, and provide accountability to the system. Uh, as others have recommended, we also encourage you all to think about when policy committees are aiming to use the work or learning of previously legislative mandated reports, studies, or committees to move forward on a related bill, that they slow down and receive a thorough overview of that work and its findings before moving forward. Additionally, the committees of jurisdiction should also discuss the ways in which previously mandated work is or is not informing their work on a, on a new proposal. Uh, we will note that the proposed shift in legislative deadlines in H702 could potentially support committees in utilizing the work of previous legislation. Committees also, sorry, was there a question? Uh, no, I think somebody just coughed in the room, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Dangerous um, of Zoom, every single sound gets picked up. <laughs> Exactly. Um, committees also currently don't have specific guidance or requirements around when to designate an entity with duties related to data collection, monitoring, and reporting back to the legislature on a given policy change or investment. Exploring a process or series of guidelines, I liked the previous recommendation related to a flowchart of some sort, um, for committees to utilize may support building a culture of accountability and data-driven decision-making throughout the legislative process, rather than isolating this work in a specific committee. Uh, and finally, I'll note that overall staffing of the state legislature should also be considered when making recommendations to strengthen accountability. Based on 2021 research from NCSL, Vermont has the third smallest legislative stash staff during session. Insufficient staffing capacity may limit the legislature's ability to use data to inform policy and implement new accountability procedures. With the remainder of my testimony, I'll share a bit more about BBF's role in monitoring Act 76 and elevate related policy recommendations on monitoring and accountability made by the BBF State Advisory Council that have informed these key considerations for you all. First, as we outlined in our annual report to the legislature on Act 76 monitoring, one key learning of our role has been that no singular indicator is sufficient to measure overall impact. Over the course of several months, we held focus groups and conducted surveys to ask partners what success for this law looked like and to name the top three things that we need to measure to understand its impact. Significant variation existed among partners based on their sector, lived experience, and the elements of the law that they anticipate to be the most successful. 
even among legislators whose expertise had shaped the bill, every partner thought differently about how to understand the impact of the law's investments and policy changes. Additionally, some recent policy recommendations endorsed by the State Advisory Council related to government accountability and the importance of partnering with those with lived experience can also lend lessons to this conversation. Over the past several years, the SAC has elevated the importance of providing more structure through guidance or a protocol for legislative committees creating new bodies. This guidance should make explicit the ways in which those with relevant lived experience in our communities are including in included in decision-making processes. An additional recommendation that our SAC and partners continuously have elevated is the need to make critical investments in data and technological infrastructure. Investments in additional staff capacity are paramount to being able to successfully build a culture of data-driven dri decision-making and continuous quality improvement. Next, I wanna speak a little bit more to our uh, role in providing evaluation support for the preschool development grant. As I mentioned, this grant is bringing over $7 million a year to the state with activities spanning five agencies and organizations. I just want to note the, that this uh, effort has taken over a year as well as a full debt a full-time dedicated staff member to define measures of success for this specific grant and to build, begin to build systems and tools to monitor and evaluate activities and the overall project, which is all to say that building a culture of accountability and data-driven work takes significant time and content area expertise, uh, and that what the bill that you all are considering today is is attempting to do it feels quite feels quite an ambitious considering the amount of resources that it is being given. We are excited to see this committee and others considering how best to improve the legislature's government accountability systems and practices, building a culture of accountability and data-driven decision making has the potential to strengthen the work of the legislature and create more systems to ensure that individuals with lived experience are heard. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for Ms. Burlett? I uh, really appreciate your detailed written testimony. I think we're getting to the, the end nearing of what's been a really long day and are starting to run out of gas a little bit. So I apologize for that. <laughs> um, Representative Higley had brought up um, the child care bill is an example of like one of the big things that we've done. And I think of that as an example of one of the kinds of big initiatives that, you know, this new uh, joint committee and the um, director position at JFO would look at and monitor. And I'm wondering from BBF's perspective, you know, did we build in sufficient look backs and accountab accountability provisions into the bill that we passed? Um, around, um, you know, setting up the new child care system or, you know, are there things that we should have done differently from an accountability perspective or just things that, um, you know, BBF has noticed that we should be tracking in terms of data that we're not? Great question. Um, I would say that Act 76, the, the child care bill, actually is kind of a unique circumstance in which the legislature was really intentional about thinking about what successful monitoring and accountability could look like. So as I mentioned in my testimony, Building Bright Futures was charged under that child care law to be the organization or entity that is holding the vision and strategy for um, both monitoring implementation that is happening at CDD and other agencies, as well as tracking data over time to understand the law's impact. Um, and through, through Act 76, we are required to submit an annual report to the legislature on our role in doing that and our op provide observations on implementation and how it is going, but also, as I said, uh, what impact has looked like so far. And we're providing um, up-to-date data to the legislature, but also the general public on, on the impact of, of that law. So I would say it's actually a, a kind of a unique uh, and potentially helpful um, situation or, or example for this committee to consider about what successful um, 
what successful examples can be looked at for, for how the legislature might be able to charge more entities with, with supporting some of that uh, government accountability work. Great. I was hoping you would say something like that, knowing uh, how deeply involved at least Representative Brumstead was on both of these efforts. <laughs> um, great. Any other questions for Anna? Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Of course. Thanks for having me. And Charles, are you still with us? I really appreciate your patience and uh, and hanging out there. Uh, I'm excited to hear your testimony about uh, your efforts in New Mexico. Yes, I'm still here, but it won't let me turn on my, oh, there's, I can start my video, video now. There we go. Great. So I think you all have a short uh, PowerPoint slide that I put together for you. Um, some of those slides are really just to provide some context about the legislating for results framework that I'll get into a little bit more detail. The first is, uh, my name's Charles Salee. I'm the director of the Legislative Finance Committee, which is the New Mexico's uh, Joint Interim Budget Committee. Uh, a couple of uh, key points for that committee's work. Uh, it basically has jurisdiction over all of uh, state and local government, higher education and, and public schools. One of its main functions is to develop a budget recommendation separate from the governor's uh, for the full legislature to consider. Oftentimes you hear people in New Mexico, we we just got out of a 30 day uh, a session and in odd years we have a 60 day session and oftentimes the public is wondering how you put together a budget or legislation in that short amount of time. And my answer is we don't, we start in September uh, putting together the budget um, for the on behalf of the legislature. Um, and so that's really important for the, the committee to be able to, to start that work. A couple of key things. Uh, it does have subpoena power. It's never been used, but it's a, a key uh, piece that's an important um, component uh, for the committee because there is another statute that requires agencies to cooperate with the staff and provide any information uh, that the staff deem necessary to carry out the work of the committee. That's a really important uh, cooperation provision we feel in New Mexico. It does have a limitation that I don't advise other states to uh, emulate, and that is that it um, prohibits, well, it, it says that agencies don't have to give us information that's otherwise confidential by law. That has inhibited our work uh, throughout the years uh, when agencies throw up a roadblock. Um, we've been able to work with uh, this administration to, to get workarounds, but uh, if, if you're considering sort of the authority of, of your staff to be able to get information. Those are important things to consider. The next slide, uh, three, just as, a, as an overview, we've got about 41 people on staff. Uh, we have a team of economists that work on the revenue estimates. We do a consensus revenue uh, estimate with the executive branch. Uh, we have a team of fiscal analysts that work on the, the budget recommendation. We do use a performance-based budgeting uh, approach in New Mexico. So they are also charged with uh, working with agencies and developing quarterly report cards that I'll get into. Uh, at the end of the day, your appropriations committees are building a budget right now. And why? It's you hope to accomplish something. And the performance measures help tell you whether or not you're heading in the right direction and accomplishing what you wanted to accomplish. So the fiscal analysts work on uh, doing that work. And then we're somewhat unique in that we house um, our government accountability unit, our program evaluation uh, team to be able to go and do the deep dive. The performance information that you will be getting if this bill passes and you move forward is good. It tells you if you're heading in the direction that you want. It doesn't tell you why or what to do about it. There's a different level of analysis that, that's needed um, in order to dig into that. And just, I wanted to note that the, the legislature this session and the feed bill uh, greatly expanded our staff by another six uh, FTE. So we'll be expanding our work into more of the health and human services area, as well as uh, additional program evaluators. On slide four, again, just context, where uh, our general fund budget's about $10 billion uh, for next year, our all funds budget almost 29 billion. The general fund um, has increased, this will be a represent an increase of well over 50% since FY19. So dramatic changes and dramatic new investments that have been made um, in our state. And really, we need to up our game to say whether those investments are in fact yielding 
better results for the people in New Mexico. And you can see a breakdown of our current budget uh, and major cost centers uh, that include public schools and health and human services. Uh, Mr. Chairman, slide five gives you a very simple, simple overview of what we call legislating for results framework. And it's a continuous process and improvement um, type of framework. And we've built it out over the past uh, 20 plus years since the state started implementing the performance-based uh, budgeting system that requires agencies to have strategic plans, uh, metrics to tell you whether you're heading in the right direction, uh, reports back to the legislature on the results and of implementation of recommendations of our program evaluations. And it really starts with these performance metrics that we're looking at. And we use these um, through our report cards as almost a surveillance tool. When you think about all of the different agencies that you have, which ones matter the most, which metrics should you be paying attention to, the report cards really help us kind of flag where we need to do that deeper dive um, to understand why and, and what to do about it. But it tells you, how are we doing? And the committee gets for the largest agencies, basically at the state of the state every quarter on uh, how our tax department's doing, how our human services department and Medicaid um, are serving individuals in, in the state, um, higher education and K-12, even though those data points aren't always available quarterly. The next uh, phase is if we're not doing as well as we want, then what should we be doing different? And doing that deep dive to answer the, the why and what to do about it. Uh, are we spending money the way on evidence-based interventions that are likely to yield good results? Are we uh, not appropriating enough to solve the problem? Um, the analyst will go in and do that analysis, and then sometimes we'll assign a deeper dive for the, the program evaluators to take three to five months to help answer some of those questions. How do we get more third graders uh, to read at grade level. Uh, one investment would be uh, through our research, our pre-K program, uh, and we develop performance metrics to monitor how that was working as we were continuing to expand that program. We also use the program evaluation to identify things that weren't leading to better educational outcomes. So we, we tell our members, if you're trying to impact uh, early literacy outcomes, the child care assistance program is not the, the investment that you'd want to make. You'd rather make that in, into pre-K. And then you build that information into the budget development process. How many slots for pre-K can we afford? How many can, teachers can we hire? How do we, how do we do that over time? And then the budget gets passed. And that's should, oftentimes that's where things tend to end. Uh, we've passed a bill, we've passed a budget to solve a problem. But really, uh, we advise our members that that's the just the first step. Uh, the next is really monitoring the implementation and the use of those investments um, that you've made to see whether or not it's paid off. Um, are the kids that participate in our pre-K program getting the kind of outcomes that we want? And our answer has been consistently yes over the last 10 years, and that's informed further investments in that to uh, the point that we've got a universal uh, four-year-old pre-K program, and we're heading towards about 50% enrollment um, in our for our three-year-olds. So that's the continuous um, process and the framework and how staff help uh, do analysis to advise the committee on the types of investments um, that it should consider. Slide six just gives you an, an idea of all the different tools that uh, we try to deploy. We've got a pretty sophisticated cost benefit analysis um, system where we can take the best research about what works, apply New Mexico specific performance and cost data and project out for the committee what the return on investment would be making for, say, a, a substance abuse treatment program in our prisons, what kind of impact we would expect it to have on um, uh, recidivism rates and the like. All of these are in addition to your traditional budget development tools, uh, looking at uh, vacancies of staff, uh, incremental cost um, for the budget. Page seven just gives you a snapshot of what um, our quarterly report cards look like. Again, we only use these for the largest agencies. All agencies, including us, uh, report annually on um, our performance metrics. We have those, we've got a strategic plan. Um, but for those biggest ones, we wanna know what's going on with our Child Protective Services um, program. Is it operating at the level we need? Or is the media uh, attention that it's getting um, focused on isolated cases or do we have systemic problems? 
these, this tool really helps start um, start the line of questioning. It doesn't necessarily answer all of them, but it really helps. A new tool that we've been implementing um, over the past two years on slide eight is what we call Legistat. And if you've heard of STAT, it's really a performance management system, often directed uh, in the private sector, but also uh, adapted in the public sector, usually by governors, mayors, um, or agency heads. And that's really looking at the data on a regular basis and, and trying to manage around that. And we've tried to adapt this um, to a legislative um, environment where we're taking a subset of all of those performance metrics that we're getting and saying, what are the three key performance challenges that we've identified um, and maybe collectively with the agency um, that we wanna focus on over the next year or two um, and have legislative oversight consistently come back to those performance challenges and understand from the agency what's different. Uh, so you'll hear the committee members ask, when we leave this hearing, what are you going to, what are your action steps? What are you going to do? What's going to be different when you come back? Um, and when we start the next meeting, what have you done? What did you accomplish? So strong accountability. Um, the other key component of this uh, new tool, because we've always had hearings on agency report cards and performance, is it flips the script where the agency only gets about five minutes. The fiscal analyst from our staff We'll go through um, the actions that the agency has been taking, any changes in performance that we've been seeing. And then we open up the hearing for members to have a more of a collaborative deep dive discussion um, with agencies rather than being talked at um, for you know, an hour and a half or two hours. Um, because the committee you know, is the board of directors and not the CEO, it's a the dynamics have to be a little bit more collaborative as opposed to what a governor could do in terms of accountability. So that's something that we've been working through um, with the committee. It does take some extra work in between meetings and prep work on the part of the committee. It's hard to sit down um, you know, and get a three-page document and be able to uh, really uh, get into the meat of it. Um, but so far, it's been working um, fairly well. We've already exited our tourism department because they were doing so good. Um, at uh, improving their performance challenges. Um, the committee wanted to focus on, you know, close to 60% of our budget, which is the hardest part to do um, for this because our higher education and K-12 system is such a decentralized governance system with not very good interim metrics, but how do you ignore 60% of the budget if you're gonna embark on this kind of um, activity? It has been good uh, from the standpoint that I've talked to agency heads who have made it very clear that they do not want to go back in front of the LFC without having taken measurable actions and being able to demonstrate improvement um, before the next time they're before the committee. And those were even collaborative meetings, but they they really want to work on those those topics that we've collectively identified to, to make improvement. So very action oriented. With that, Mr. Chairman, I know you've had a long day and, and I'd be happy to stand for um, any questions. One of the things that came to mind was I'm wondering how your committee, when they looked at some of those decentralized questions that are big numbers, you know, we're having enormous policy conversations as well here in Vermont about education finance and our very decentralized decision-making system around the local control of school boards. Yeah. And I'm wondering how, how did they sort of bite into that? Did they focus on, you know, certain funding streams? Like how do you, what, how did they even sort of start to look at accountability and, and what measures that they wanted to put in place in order to understand what the performance was of the system would be. Sure, we, we've got a pretty sophisticated and, and um, far reaching um, performance measurement system for K-12. The problem is that it, most of it is snapshot data at the end of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. At the end of the year when you get test data or your high school graduation, and there's not as much interim data. So we tried to focus in on, for K-12, two leading indicators. And the first, we started this when we were coming out of COVID and the state was not doing any testing at all and didn't seem like it was going to be moving in that direction. And so our first goal was to um, get the executive to agree to actually see where our kids were at coming out of COVID and actually administer the test. Uh, which it, it did, and I don't think it would have otherwise done it without Legistat. The second was to shine a light on um, 
attendance gaps that we were noticing. Um, you know, we've done a lot of research that uh, it's pretty obvious if you're not at school, you're not learning and you're probably not going to be performing as well. And the, the rate of kids not attending school um, has really increased quite a bit. And so there's been a lot of focus on, on doing deeper dives on, on attendance as an interim metric. We are, we did have a school finance <laughs> lawsuit um, adverse ruling against the state in 2019. And we've put in well over, you know, a billion, probably close to a billion five cents um, into a suite of interventions that were all informed by a lot of this research um, that we have been, been doing over the past decade. Um, everything from pre-K to an extended school year um, to uh, not just increased teacher pay, but um, really trying to support high quality teaching and effective school leadership. And members are increasingly questioning why those investments aren't yielding better results. Um, so they're using these tools to try to, to dig in to understand that. Any questions from the The, I will tell you that our summer government accountability committee was really excited by what you're doing in New Mexico. Um, they looked at these, you know, sort of your legislative reports are almost like a heads up display of what's going on, what performance measures have we identified, how are the agencies doing. Um, getting from where we are now, where, you know, where I was describing in that previous testimony that. A lot of times we feel a little starved for the information that we need uh, to where we want to be. Um, you know, we, we are considering empowering this committee in several different ways. Uh, I appreciate the specific recommendation on uh, access to confidential records, and we'll definitely take that to heart as we look at how we give this committee tools. But I'm wondering, did, did this process kind of phase in and grow and become part of the New Mexico legislature's story over time or was it something where there was like a big push and a whole bunch of investment in a year or two no this has been growing over time over the past 20 plus years so it, it started with um in the early 90s uh our some of the the chairman of the committee were frustrated because they were making appropriations for specific things and didn't know whether it was making a difference or not and we were one of the um, last states to include and build out a performance audit unit. They originally housed that over at the state auditor's office. Um, and then there was a, a change in state auditor and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. So the legislature took those FTEs and put them in the LFC. And then in the late nineties, there was a big push for performance-based budgeting and New Mexico implemented that. And that, that, place the foundation of the performance measurement system into place in the quarterly reporting. And then about 2005, we instituted the report card system and started, when I started in 2005, uh, reforming how we did the performance audits to answer more of the outcome and impact evaluation questions that the legislature had at the time. And so we revamped that performance audit unit into a program evaluation unit to answer those questions. Does pre-K make a difference or not? versus a uh, compliance audit or auditing performance measures, whether they're accurate or not. And then we worked with Pew and their results first initiative to build out our staff capability to do that cutting edge cost benefit analysis, uh, continue to refine how we, um, the analyst uh, worked with agencies around understanding the performance measures and how to make meaningful use of that. Um, and then most recently uh, worked with a consultant um, through a grant through Pew to help the committee develop the Legistat model. So it's a it's been a, a long iterative process. I would you know suggest you all consider what are some priority areas that you'd want to start with. Um, maybe even looking at areas where you're already getting some performance data reported. You know federally funded programs tend to to already have a pretty sophisticated apparatus. You know, it might be a child protective services, which has an extensive performance reporting system um, and be able to, to start there and then build it, build it out over time. 
Those are all great suggestions. Do you have a question, Representative Major? Yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering if the report card system, um, which I love that, um, was was that hard to implement and like who helped make it happen as far as like agencies or? Right, so all of the agencies, I mean, many of the report cards are actually written into the budget or the, the performance measures are written into the budget and the legislature sets the performance target. Um, other measures are agreed upon between the governor's budget shop and our office that we should be measuring them in collaboration with the, the agencies. And so those are all, for the big agencies, that data is reported from the agency to the governor's office and our office on a quarterly basis. And then our staff put it into the template and do analysis around what's the data telling us. The legend stat kind of format on a smaller subset of key metrics might be a good way to, to start as well. Um, I, you could talk to our members and when we do our state of the state quarterly report, sometimes I feel like it may be too much of a data dump on volunteer board, on volunteer legislators, but they've got that information in every budget hearing. They've got that information and anytime an agency's up, they're gonna have their report card and some of them are latching on to asking key questions of agencies every time they're before the committee. Even in other committees, we go and present those report cards. Thanks. That's right. a, a way to link, Mr. Chairman, some of the work that um, the staff that you, you are considering funding to your policy and standing committees is to be able to report out if you're uh, if you've got a, a performance report, how your corrections department's doing on recidivism, you know, to your courts and criminal justice or whatever the name of it is uh, during the interim. And it, we've we found that that force multiplication helps better unify the legislature to understand how the executive branch is really operating. Oh, that sounds like a dream compared to where we're at right now. Uh, but it's, I think we're a little less far along in our journey, uh, but uh, happy to stand on your shoulders out there in New Mexico. <laughs> and Mr. Um, Chairman, we're happy to provide any resources and assistance if this comes to fruition, or even if not, if you continue to, to work on this, we're happy to be of assistance to, to your legislative staff to um, help them learn more about how we've developed this, these, pro these uh, tools. Great. Um, any other questions for Charles from the committee? All right. We have, uh, I believe, maybe a familiar face to you, uh, Mr. Silly, um, our chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, who is one of our uh, members of the uh, summer GAC, the Summer Government Accountability Committee, uh, is going to wrap up our work on 702 for today. And I really deeply appreciate you being with us, Representative Kornheiser. I know you have had a long day as well. <laughs> I have, but I got to eat some potato chips on my way here, and that really perked me up. Too. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Emily Kornheiser, representative from Brattleboro. Um, if I can step like a few years back from the Summer Government Accountability Committee work, is that okay with you? Yes, please. I, I wanted you to kind of like... Help us remember the story of how we got here. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the story of my career, if um, that's okay. So I um, pretty much since graduated from college have worked for nonprofits, primarily um, in the international development space. And I was focused on what government accountability looks like when we sort of leave the continental U.S. and are acting overseas. Um, and what accountability means when we primarily contract for services rather than doing those services ourselves. When I stopped doing international development and started working locally in Vermont, I continued that real focus on what does accountability look like in the context of contracted services, um, which is, as you all probably know better than anyone in this building, primarily how government is, you know, delivers here in Vermont. And so as part of that work, um, originally with AHS and then with a number of other community partners, I was a member of the Vermont Accountability Group, which was a statewide collaborative of folks who were working in government accountability um, that was facilitated and chaired by Drew Resley, who was the Performance Accountability Director at the Agency of Human Services for a decade. Um, 
and had stakeholders from across and beyond state government, contractors, consultants, folks who did um, the bulk of evaluations for um, state government, folks who um, were on the ground doing this work, trainers um, who had been trained at the national level and sort of beyond that. I met Representative Brumstead for the first time before I was elected to the legislature in the context of the Vermont Accountability Group. In those meetings, we began talking about what it would look like to strengthen the ability of the legislature to carry out this work, um, to carry out meaningful accountability work in collaboration with state government, in collaboration with the administration, especially and including our contracted services. At that time, we were talking just about performance notes um, and really trying to move that together because Representative Brumstead, who was elected before me, has really been focused on this since her first, you know, since her first day in the legislature as well. Um, when I was elected in 2019, I think that's right. Um, actually, I have no idea at this particular moment. But when I was elected, um, I was appointed to the previously um, conceived government accountability, appointed by the Speaker, <laughs> previous government accountability committee, committee um, which you all sunsetted last year. Thank you for that. Um, that group was conceived of originally as a committee whose work it was to make sure that we were holding the administration and the legislature accountable to the performance measures that are spelled out in long ago's Act 186. Um, we did not have the resources to do that even slightly effectively, let alone well. And I want to spend a moment describing sort of what we attempted and why it didn't work in order to draw a very clear picture for you of why I think the legislation that you have in front of you as you've developed it is important and why our summer work pointed in that direction. So the first thing that we were really focused on um, in the Government Accountability Committee was essentially like, how do we look at these performance measures and these population outcomes that are spelled out in statute and how do we understand what is happening like in the real world as regards to these po population outcomes? Like we say, we want all Vermonters to be healthier, all children to be safe. But like, what does that actually mean in terms of how we do government? And I'll tell you the folks on the Government Accountability Committee, one, did not have the expertise to understand what that sort of level of data science meant. Um, and two, did not have the time or the bandwidth to dive in to how specific performance or programs or spending lined up with those big picture population outcomes. So we knew that the administration was creating those data sets for us, giving us to them, but the expertise to dive into that and to really understand what meaningful and useful data is, where to disaggregate, where to analyze it, where to say that the curve should be going in this direction versus this direction, the committee did not have that expertise because we are a citizen legislature, and we did not have the staff available to help us have that expertise. So we were all, as we all do every day, and I'm sorry to say this on the record, making it up as we go along. <laughs> um, and that really didn't work at this like sort of essential crux of like, what do numbers mean for the well-being of Vermonters? And so we tried, um, and that work, it was just like a summer committee, right? And as you all know, the connection between sort of a summer committee's work and the standing committee's work is tenuous at best. We don't have formal connections between those two things. And so what we then tried to do is say, actually, the meaningful work of government accountability needs to happen at the committee level, right? Our human services committee needs to dive in and say, okay, we set this childcare bill forward in statute is it actually making a difference for Vermonters? If it's not making a difference for Vermonters, is it not making a difference for Vermonters because we're not administering it well, because we're not spending what we said we were gonna spend, or because our whole idea was really dumb to start with, right? And those are sort of the three ways that you fall short when you're achieving outcomes. It's like your original theory of change didn't work, you didn't actually, or you didn't actually carry out your theory of change, which could be sort of like personnel and systems, or it could be not fully funding an idea. And so all three of those different things point to very different solutions, but our standing committees did not have the expertise to dive into sort of those three very separate questions, which are sometimes described as how much are we doing? How well are we doing? Is anyone better off? 
but you can just describe it in like the regular plain language way I did before. And so we tried to do trainings for the whole general assembly. And we had, um, I conducted the training with Drew Wrestley, who is an actually internationally acclaimed and qualified trainer on performance accountability. And we did that for, I think like 80 members came to an off session full day training, which is like still to this day, I look back on that and I'm like, how, how and why did so many people show up? This is incredible, right? And that points to me like that this is an issue that's incredibly meaningful to people. We had, um, it was incredibly nonpartisan who came into the room. There was a mix of committee chairs and new members and people really spent their whole day with us going through this really comprehensive training. We gave workshops that people could use to create outlines before they even gave a bill to legislative council. We created outlines for specific ways that people can ask questions in standing committees. We really handed over every single tool, including training and how to use those tools to the General Assembly. And then afterwards, a number of committee chairs asked us to come into their committees and do follow up. This was three years ago. This was pre-pandemic. So it was more than three years ago. It was however many years ago that was. Um, and I'll tell you, that was really fun and it felt really effective and it made no difference at all, none. Because we are all lost in the day-to-day -day muck and mire of the work that is right in front of us in our committees. And so after that process, before I joined the legislature, the process of serving on the Government Accountability Committee, I, Jessica and I basically, having worked together on this for all these years, came to the summer reimagining of the Government Accountability Committee and said to ourselves and to all of our witnesses, good intentions are not gonna cut it around here. We need actual systemic supported reform if we are gonna carry out our essential obligation to Vermonters, which is to responsibly spend public dollars towards public good. And that's essentially why you have this bill in front of us. Like we need to firmly and comprehensively staff this responsibility so that we all have meaningful guidance when we make decisions every day about whether or not we're making a difference. And I think until we do that, until it's someone's direct responsibility to help us with this, we are not gonna get anywhere on this. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Representative Nugent has a question for you. Um, so the in the summer group, I'm just curious like if the overall goal because like statewide, you can see population level outcomes, you know, like education, reading level, stuff like that. You can see how well it's working is like part of the hope with what we're doing um, is to be able to assess like the individual parts that make that up so we can know like what parts need more, um, whatever it is to, to improve the overall outcome. But is it, yeah. Yeah. So let's say we passed uh, Act 173 a few years ago that reformed special education funding. That's one that I was just talking about committee. And we know that educational outcomes have gone down since then. And we know that special ed funding has costs for special ed have gone up. That's really as far as we know. And we don't necessarily have the expertise to help us figure out what the right questions are to ask to dive deeper into understanding that data well in order to say, how can we make changes? And so without that, I think we make changes based on our guts, which are great. That's, we're all here because I think we have really good values and really good guts. Um, but we need to also be driven by data. And I think without guidance on what quality data is and what questions to ask of data, we're a little bit at loose ends. Other questions for Representative Kornheiser? Your last statement uh, reminded me of what the gentleman from Mexico had talked about. You know, there was a, a big increase in spending for education, and they're finding that their, their standards aren't coming up to snuff, too. So um, the only other thing, and, and I had some questions and concerns about uh, the whole process, in a sense, and, and you had talked about the child care uh, bill in particular, as far as, you know, is it doing what it was supposed to be doing? Do we need to put in more money? Or is it just a bad idea? And, you know, I think I would have liked to have heard you said, too, um, is where we're getting the money from hurting the uh, uh, industry as far as payroll tax? And again, because then we're going to 
we're going to go down the road in another year or so for, uh, you know, the paid family and sick leave. And that was looked at as a payroll tax. So again, I guess, uh, you know, I have to go back to the accumulative effect again of what we're doing to Vermonters. And, and again, you expressed it too, is what we do for Vermonters, is, is, it, is, it, is it good for the public good? And that's a huge question. It's just a, it's a huge endeavor. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced that, you know, New Mexico has done it completely. And I'm not convinced that, that we're going we're gonna to do it. But. I don't think we have anyone on staff to actually help us answer that question. So um, we have folks who are, you know, can understand the immediate fiscal impacts of our decisions or project out the fiscal impacts of our decisions, but they don't do dynamic modeling. And they don't help us figure out how we might want to understand the future. Um, so to figure out, you know, when we pass a child care bill, what are the questions we need to ask on that bill? So then when we look back, we know that we did make a difference. We know what data we want to track to make sure we made a difference so we can make course corrections. Um, you know, we pass a number of tax credits, really great tax credits that we sort of know from national data make a really big difference in Vermonters' lives. And that costs money from the public purse, right? And so we want to make sure that as we go along, we are really making sure we're understanding and exploring exactly as you said, does that make a difference in Vermonters' lives? And did we put into that legislation what we need to understand in the future? Because you really want to collect data from the beginning of a process, right, to do a good job. And, you know, I started my testimony explaining to you how much I think about this stuff in the course of my day-to-day -day life. And I don't put that stuff in my bills. And like, this is like my whole professional career is focused on these questions. And when I'm like, you know, putting together legislation, I don't even remember to ask these questions. And so that's why like, you know, and we put before historic, like, you know, those used to be those little yellow cards that were on a bunch of committee tables um, that didn't do the trick. And so I don't know if New Mexico has it figured out perfectly. I know their legislature meets even less often than we do. So they need even more staff support. Um, but when I met them at a conference and heard a presentation from them, um, I was really like, they are certainly a lot closer than we are on figuring this out. And I think there's a lot to learn from them. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I think in, if you look at the deck that Mr. Salia gave us, they've got three buckets of staff that are related to this. Uh, and it's pretty comprehensive. And I mean, they're not, what's the scale of New Mexico is essentially by population and budget, like three times-ish Vermont size. So it's not totally out of the realm. You know, they're still a relatively small state. And I think what they do, they, you know, they're doing comprehensively in a way that it would be a lot to jump into for us. But I'll, you know, in our work over the summer, it became clear that almost every other state has someone within their legislature that does something like this, right? The federal government has the GAO, the Government Accountability Office. Um, but there are much smaller scale versions of this in almost every state. And it goes beyond, you know, you don't need a full scale economist. You need someone who has practiced in performance and population accountability. Well, I think we're going to take a look at the draft that we have before us and try to encapsulate some of the things that we heard today. Um, there's a couple of recommendations that Mr. Sully made that I think are really important for us to think about in terms of the, the information that the Joint Committee has access to um, that we might want to look at. And um, I think in particular, I, Director Davis was in here from ORE and, um, you know, I know that we tasked the summer, summer Government Accountability Committee with too much stuff. <laughs> and now it's back on us. And I made a commitment to her that we would definitely be taking up um, some of the data that she's gathered on various topics. But I think that we might need to more explicitly build in in the next draft of seven or two what we, how we're going to build into um, our work here and the analysis, you know, the, the lens of equity and, you know, whose voices come into that data. Are we asking the right questions? And is it, you know, getting interpreted in a way that looks at 
equity as an, a priority for us as a state. So those are a couple of the areas, but I think we're awfully close and I deeply appreciate what the summer GAC did in a really short amount of time to get us on a path to adopting some real performance accountability, uh, staffing and resources here. Anybody else uh, have anything for on this? All right, so we have one task before us <laughs> that is not related to H702. So uh, I wanna thank our witnesses who stuck around on Zoom and in the room on this bill.